Good evening, uh, and welcome to Network 2020's virtual briefing series, where tonight we'll be talking about a centennial celebration and the road ahead for China's Communist Party. I'm Courtney Dogger, and I'm the president of Network 2020, and it's a pleasure uh, to have three excellent speakers tonight and to have all of you join us for this discussion. Um, before we begin, for those who are joining us for the first time, um, Network 2020 is an inclusive international community. We're based in New York. We uh, have several different programs, but we're really trying to leverage entrepreneurial, established, and emerging leaders to drive innovative research and highlight interesting um, and innovative solutions critical to foreign policy challenges. So we do this foreign policy briefing series. Uh, we also have uh, member-only salon discussions right now on Zoom. We'll also be resuming some of those in New York in the fall. We do research abroad. We're just launching a project on Tunisia. Um, and we also are working with uh, entrepreneurship promotion as well. So we have our hands in a lot of different areas. Um, and so please do check us out online. So to introduce our panelists tonight, I'm not going to read their bios, but I uh, just want to mention a few words about why we wanted them in this discussion. So first we have Professor Bruce Dixon, who is at uh, George Washington University. Um, and we wanted to have him speak because he really focuses on the internal political dynamics in China, as well as the adaptability of the Chinese Communist Party. So um, he is a very important voice in this discussion. Um, next, we have uh, Professor Rong Bin Han, uh, who is an associate professor in the Department of International Affairs at the University of Georgia. And his research is really interesting because he focuses on uh, political participation and authoritarian regimes, um, and also just you know being very forward looking, also looking at media and cyber politics. And so as we look ahead, you know, 100, after the 100th anniversary of the CCP, what comes next, I think his voice will be a very important one. And uh, last but not least, we have Dr. Zoe Liu, who is an instructional assistant professor at Texas A&M's Bush School of Government and Public Service in Washington, DC. And her research really focuses on um, on the economics, on international political economy, um, and her area expertise is in East Asia. And so she can really bring the economic piece to this discussion. And moderating tonight, we have uh, Dr. Joanna Vostrowski, who is a Network 2020 member um, and who has her PhD from Oxford and is an advisor to governments and uh, think tanks, NGOs, um, and she's worked on political campaigns. So she is very much in the policy world. And so we're fortunate to have her run this discussion tonight. So thanks to the four of you, thanks to everyone joining us. And so with that, over to you, Joanna. Thank you so much, Courtney. So this month, the Chinese Communist Party is celebrating its 100th anniversary in power. President and General Secretary Xi Jinping has marked the occasion with special month-long events and a celebration speech. In that speech, he emphasized that the CCP was the only force capable of ensuring the country's rise, the vehicle for the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. In addition, he argued that China's successful model provides an alternative to democracy that other countries could follow. He warned that any country that challenged China's sovereignty would crack their heads and spill blood on the Great Wall of Steel built from the flesh and blood of 1.4 billion Chinese people. What we will explore this evening is how the CCP has evolved over time, including what factors have influenced its ideology and behavior, and what impact this has had on Chinese foreign policy. In addition, what will the party's priorities be in the near future, and how will they shape China's relations with the United States, as well as with its South China Sea neighbors? So now I'd like to first turn to Bruce. Um, it, I have a two-part question. First, can you provide a very brief history of the CCP and how it has evolved particularly under Xi. Also, how have domestic politics influenced China's foreign policy? Well, thanks for giving me the, uh, the first take on, on the, <laughs> the uh, program tonight. So let's uh, thank 
Never 2020 for inviting me to be here and thank all of you who are tuned in for tonight's event. Uh, as Joanna mentioned, 100 years ago in July of 1921, it was when the Chinese Communist Party had its first meeting. Uh, at the time, it was a very small group, barely a dozen people uh, attended the first meeting. You would not, if you're a betting person, you would not have bet that they'd become the ruling party of China. Uh, a few decades later, that it would remain as China's ruling party more than 70 years after uh, winning its civil war. Uh, it went through a variety of challenges and uh, near um, failures. Uh, throughout its existence, it's often switched back and forth between sort of promoting sort of the ideological goals of creating sort of a communist utopia the way that Marx would have envisioned and more practical considerations of economic development uh, and also promoting nationalism. So during the period before it became the ruling party, whenever it was promoting uh, economic development, especially in the countryside, that's when it would gain more support, its influence would spread uh, as it uh, both during the civil war, on and off civil war for about uh, 20 years, uh, sandwiched in between those episodes of civil war. It was in, engaged uh, with the, the Chinese government at the time with a war against Japan during World War II. Uh, it sort of used its, its um, efforts to push Japan out of China as a way of rallying nationalism and creating nationalism among the Chinese people, especially the peasantry. And that was also a key part of its uh, continued survival and eventually success uh, in gaining power in 1949. Um, even afterwards, that, that tension between pursuing ideological goals and more practical considerations of economic development seesawed in its, its uh, time as the ruling party. Uh, That's true during the Maoist years. Uh, it's true especially in the post-Mao years. So beginning in the late 1970s, going forward, the focus really has been primarily on economic development, economic modernization. And its, uh, its popular support is based not so much on promoting just expansion of the economy, but the degree to which people think their own standards of living, their incomes are rising, if they're optimistic about that continuing into the future. Uh, patriotism remains a key source of support for the party. Uh, the party sort of wrapped itself in the flag uh, to be patriotic, according to the party, means supporting the party as well. You can't have one without the other from its point of view. Um, and uh, improved governance. Uh, so moving away from more ideological goals and focusing on more practical considerations. Under Xi Jinping, however, there's been a focus towards more um, reasserting the party into everyday life the way it had not been for the last couple of decades. The, the key element of the reform period is getting the party out of everyday life for most Chinese, getting it out of decision-making for most firms. Uh, but uh, Xi Jinping has reasserted the party front and center in all aspects of economic and social life in the country. Uh, so in some ways it's a reversion uh, to a more political orientation uh, for the party and its, its uh, effort to remain as China's ruling party. At this point, its hold on power seems pretty secure. There's no organized opposition. There's no dissident movement. Uh, there's no one, no individual figure like Alexei Navalny in Russia who sort of represents an alternative that, that enjoys any degree of popular support. Um, and so in that sense, it, it, it seems, position seems secure, and yet it's moving away from what has been its uh, core aspects of, of creating support and legitimacy for itself and moving in many ways back toward a more orthodox Leninist one party regime. Um, second question was, how does that influence its foreign policy? Mm -hmm. uh, part of it is, is uh, beginning about the time of the Olympics uh, in 2008, the Beijing Olympics, uh, and soon after followed by the global financial crisis, China's leaders um, became more confident in their own approach to governance and the economy, less willing to listen to international criticism of its, of its policies, 
it, the Chinese leaders said, well, look at the disaster that you just caused. Who are you to give us advice uh, about things? Uh, so they've developed since then a more confident, almost arrogant approach in its foreign policy um, that it expanded its influence uh, around the globe. Uh, the Belt and Road Initiative has been the kind of the signature foreign policy program of Xi Jinping at its created sort of a global impact for China. At the same time, it remains very insecure about foreign influences, wanting to limit foreign influences coming into China that may destabilize things, question its, uh, its orientation, um, and argues that uh, the US and other Western countries are still trying to contain China and limit its ability to have a more of a global uh, leadership role. Um, so it has this combination of being very confident in asserting its position, uh, but at the same time, uh, seeming to portray that its, its, um, its position is contingent on whether or not Western countries, foreign countries more generally, uh, cooperate with it or push back against it. And um, how unified is the party? Uh, as best we can tell, and that's that's an important qualifier, um, it seems unified. Since the demonstrations in 1989, the Chinese Communist Party has made a priority of presenting United Front uh, to the public. So there's, we know there are factions within the party, but we don't really know exactly how strong they are, what they do. Uh, Xi's position seems to be quite secure, even within the top leadership. There's no one who's seen as an alternative or a challenger. Um, some of his policies, especially his anti-corruption policy uh, that began when he was general secretary, um, obviously created enemies because a lot of people ended up in jail and fired from their positions. Uh, but it was also a very popular campaign. Uh, were because most people in China think that corruption is one of the biggest issues in the country. So he was directly addressing a very popular concern. Um, so it's, at this point, his hold on power and his, the way that he's centralized authority in himself uh, has surprised most outside observers. Uh, but there doesn't seem to be really any alternative to him, uh, no breaks on his power, and really no clear sign about who will come after him. Okay, thank you. And of course, Zoe and Rongbin, if you want to add anything, please feel free to um, at, at, at any time. So then um, I'll turn to you, um, to Zoe, since we're going up in <laughs> informality here. How has China's economic conditions changed under President Xi, and how has that impacted the economic aspect impacted China's foreign policy? And, and maybe if you could also speak a little bit about the Belt and Road Initiative. Yeah, thank you very much, Joanna, and also thank you very much, Courtney, for uh, inviting me to be here tonight at Network 2020. It's a great honor to be here, and I also appreciate all our attendees' time to uh, be here joining us uh, in this uh, discussion. So just uh, uh, in response to uh, Joanna, your, your, your question, I guess, you know, to, to sort of, to, to frame the China's economic situation changed under President Xi, I, I, I guess I would like to frame it um, using uh, some quote from senior members of, of the CCP leaders themselves. You know, for example, President Xi and uh, other Politburo members such as Wang Yang um, had said, they, they have said earlier this year that uh, the time and the situation are on China's side. And uh, uh, I also wanted to point it out that, you know, this is not the Chinese leaders of CCP leaders themselves, they were not uh, the first uh, nor uh, the only people that had made such assessment. You know, like for example, uh, Ray Dalio, the founder of Bridgewater, he mentioned and made this kind of a similar comment uh, October last year. He said, you know, time is on China's side and is not on the US side when he was giving a speech at the Milken Institute Global Conference, right? So, uh, you know, although, you know, this kind of frame, this, this kind of frame is not necessarily just on economics, 
uh, situation, but I, I guess it's more about China's overall uh, economic and political situation relative to the rest of the world. And uh, and I think you know uh, there are there are, under President Xi's leadership there are ways that we can sort of rationalize or justify uh, why people come up with this this kind of assessment. So I ju just give you an example. You know, besides, you know, the BRI, the, the BRI example you mentioned, I just wanted to, you know, to to use some most recent examples, like for example, the pandemic last year, and despite the pandemic, uh, China maintained its position as the world uh, largest trading nation in goods, uh, at least measured by the past five years on average. And most impressively, last year, uh, China also overtook the United States and became the European Union's largest trading partner. And the China's export to Europe benefited from, of course, strong demand from uh, medical equipment and electronics. Um, and in addition to that, uh, China also surpassed the United States as the largest recipient of uh, foreign direct investment last year, despite the COVID pandemic. Um, you know, besides all this positive trade or investment signs, China's uh, rapid e economic recovery from the pandemic has also led to some uh, more, even more positive uh, or most optimistic estimates about the China's uh, long-term economic outlook. So for example, last year, uh, by the end of the last year, uh, London-based Center for Economics and Business Research estimated that China would overtake the United States to become the world's biggest economy in 2028, which was five years earlier than the previous estimation. And besides this, you know, there are also several other uh, major geopolitical and geoeconomic achievement on multiple fronts just by the end of last year. Uh, for example, you know, one is the uh, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership or the RCEP. And then there is also the China-EU Comprehensive uh, Agreement on Investment, you know, the, 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 the ink of the, the agreement before uh, the, 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 the issue on uh, Xinjiang cottons and all that. So those positive signs are put, these, these positive signs are, you know, uh, good testimony to China's recent economic development under President Xi's leadership. But then on the other hand, I also want to cautious us in terms of, you know, the global, general global environment that China today is facing, which is, you know, China today, the global environment that China facing today is, is no longer the same as the time when China first joined WTO in 2000, uh, 2001. You know, input more, 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 more explicitly, if, if you, when at the, the early years of China's joining uh, the WTO, the envir global environment is more uh, accommodating and more welcoming. Now the things have, have changed, right? The environment China now facing today is less accommodating or even to a certain extent unwelcoming. So this kind of unwelcoming environment may have sort of pushed the Chinese leaders to uh, step up a little bit and to try to emphasize self-reliance. So on the one hand, we've observed the deteriorating relationship with the United States, as well as other powers, Western powers. Um, so it basically means China today would have would have to deal with this perhaps long term. Uh, in, in, at least in the in, in the midterm, less welcoming global environment. And then on the other hand, uh, the three year of US China trade war and uh, the stringent US technology sanctions against China have not yielded the outcome desired by the Uni United States in the sense that, you know, these have uh, accelerated the process for China and a lot of Chinese tech companies to seek global dominance or even monopoly along global supply chains, especially along strategic minerals like you know cobalt or, or, or rare earths uh, 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 and this kind of mineral uh, along the global supply chain. So all these uh, macroeconomic uh, trend have sort of led to the CCP's recent strategic adjustment or the so-called dual circulation that we have all heard of, which is, you know, on the one hand, indeed, we acknowledge the use of international market, but we are 
or the, China, the, the CCP now is saying that, oh, okay, so now we are going to put more emphasis on self-reliance and on the domestic market. So, you know, the CCP's reason to policy change not only is, is not only driven by domestic element, but also driven by a lot of the international factors that CCP or China has to deal with. So going forward, I would emphasize one point, you know, in addition to trade, in addition to investment and the technology supply chain, I would, wa I would want to emphasize one element which is financial security. So I would, uh, I, I would anticipate that the importance of financial security is only going to be more important in CCP's calculation. And this can be seen in President Xi's own emphasis on strengthening the party's leadership on financial affairs and his own emphasis on increasing China's profile in global financial governance. Back to you. Thank you very much for that. And now um, I will switch gears and um, ask you, Rongmin, um, how does the CCP use social media and other propaganda platforms to promote its ideology? Um, and is there any resistance or social activism against their messaging? Um, or is there a local group, local groups trying to influence um, CCP policy? Okay, um, thank you very much, Joanna, Courtney, um, and everyone here. I'm so thrilled to join this great panel, actually, um, with great, great scholars here, um, my colleagues here. So um, for your question, the first one um, about um, the CCP using social media and other pro propaganda platforms to promote its ideology, um, I think we need to paint the big picture first. First of all, we know that uh, traditionally, China has a more controlled media system. So most newspapers, TV stations are either directly or indirectly controlled or at least affiliated with the party. So the control level is much higher there. Um, but of course, with media commercialization, we do see other influences that are sometimes uh, challenging the party's control over the media. So you see slightly more pro-media media outlets or, a pro-liberal media outlets like Southern Weekend, for instance, which popped up quite a few years ago. Obama visited uh, the, 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 the newspaper actually, which actually um, uh, caused some uh, incident because um, the party censored the interview to a significant extent and the newspaper decided to publish the front page half blank as a way of protest. And of course, then that ensures punishment from the party. So that's that's the part of the story. My personal research is more on the internet. I think your question is also more about social media. So there, um, there are two things. One, of course, is control, right? So in terms of promoting the party's ideology, you want to rule out alternative ideologies or other content that the party doesn't like. So I can talk kind of, you know, for hours about how the party censors stuff in particular, because it's so complicated and it, it's fast evolving. Uh, it involves like, um, you know, a variation in terms of who, when, what, how, and why the government censors a particular type of content. So for instance, we know that central government and local government have very different preferences of censorship. We also know that uh, business interests might get involved they can influence the propaganda uh, department or those sensory agencies to censor for their interest. Um, we also know that the party might prefer censoring um, collective action related uh, content more than general criticism. But we also know that the party censors criticism at top leadership. So all those kind of things. And a late, I, I, recently co-authored uh, co an article that looks at the party when the party censors stuff. For instance, we find that uh, during important political ceremonies, the party's general control over the internet is much tighter. It's not just like say, you know, um, there are certain incidents the party is going to censor anyways, but it's like a shrinking of to toleration in general. Some of the negative news that you can publish or you can, you can express online before the event are censored now. So that seems 
happen a lot. It's just like, you know, a change in the speed limit control. Suddenly it changes from like allowing you to drive at 65 miles per hour to 40 miles per, per hour. That's like that. And uh, of course, there are other studies showing that the censorship can vary even during a particular crisis. For instance, um, the Boshilai case, I think uh, Bruce hinted a little bit on uh, earlier on when talking about the top leadership struggle there. Boshilai was a former um, Politburo member and the, the party chief of Chongqing. So people uh, saw him as a, a kind of almost a viable content uh, uh, to, to Xi Jinping in a sense. Um, but he was actually um, now in jail. But anyways, so it's it's a lot. A lot of things can be talked about on censorship controlling. Um, control is not perfect, but it's quite effective. Not perfect in that um, um, tech-savvy, resourceful people are always able to circumvent the censorship to a certain degree. Um, some of the topics are more tightly censored than others, but effective in that uh, the majority of the population are actually being situated in a very controlling information environment. So that's kind of the situation there in terms of controlling. But also the party is starting to promote um, its ideology in a more creative and in innovative way online right now. So we've heard about the 50 cent army, which means the party hires people to pretend to be ordinary citizens and spread discourses or voices the party likes. So a lot of those people are party officials actually or, or local party um, agents or of, uh, local government agents. And also the party innovated, innovates in terms of propaganda technology or tactics. So they can make the content party, party, uh, party ideology more appealing by wrapping it up into more updated um, um, way of communications. For instance, um, sometimes the party would co-opt a social media producer, influencer, and ask it to produce uh, content on behalf of the government so that um, it can speak more effectively to the, uh, to the citizens. And also we know that the party contracts the responsibility out, including censorship, but also here. And the party are sponsoring a lot of its local government, government agencies or agents to get online and create content for them. So we know that the party is setting up official accounts on all popular media platforms, WeChat, Weibo, Douyin, which is the Chinese version of TikTok. Um, they, they are everywhere and they're promoting the type of content the party wants. And they are creating in a very uh, relatable way rather than the old cliche of, of propaganda. Um, so uh, they are hiring experts. Um, university professors, tech startups are doing the job for, for governments now. Um, in a sense, the party is outsourcing. Uh, they, this type of uh, experts and professionals are very important, especially in online opinion monitoring. So for instance, they are, um, there are computer um, kind of um, experts or computer science experts writing programs, watching what's going on online and then generates reports for different levels of government all the, while, all the way up to central government but also to local governments. So they are doing all this kind of things. Um, they are pervasive online. So basically put it in this way. Uh, to answer your second question, of course, there is resistance. There's resistance. Um, there are different types of resistance in China. To a certain extent, we can argue that the party tolerates a certain level of resistance or protest, social unrest. Of course, it depends on the nature. If you're calling for um, democratizing China, overthrowing the party, then there's no room or you know, separatism, for instance, since involving Taiwan, Xinjiang, Tibet, those kind of things are almost taboo. Uh, so you can't do anything there unless you are beyond the control of the party. So you circumvent the Great Firewall, say things on Twitter, then that's a little bit beyond the state's control. But if you're protesting about local corruption, there is a chance you got censored, but also there's a chance that uh, you, you are allowed. Um, 
local governments hate this a lot of the times, and they would uh, put people, detain people, um, uh, kind of accusing them for spreading the rumor, say a natural uh, scandal, local scandal. They, they would do that, but a lot of the times uh, people can get away with it. And indeed, the party has set up a lot of official platforms uh, encouraging people to tip off. So all these kind of things happen there. And uh, about resistance, a particular type is worth noting, which we call online activism. So you are using the internet not really to promote a offline protest or organize or mobilize, but you are just venting your dissatisfaction with the party, with local governments, all sorts of things like this. And this is something much more challenging for the government to really censor because people can be very creative here. Uh, in the past, the party relies on keywords in particular. And then it's very easy for you to go through that or go, go around it because if you don't allow people to say, you know, 18, 1989, Right, you add, as you add a space between 89, then the automatic filtering system cannot recognize it. The party evolves, of course, by updating the keywords list and all things like that. And then people started to use pictures um, and then videos. So there's always a room. It's like a tit for tat game there. Um, both sides are evolving. Um, there's always a room for that. In particular, that there is a large cyberspace which is beyond the Great Firewall. But re recently, we do have heard uh, we have heard about the party reaching beyond that because uh, they can trace you down if you're inside China. They can still actually uh, detain you for for that. We've heard a number of cases like that. People very active on Twitter and then got found out. Uh, their physical location inside China and then got invited to tea or detained. Invited to tea is an um, informal way of questioning people, okay? So that's people use eh, uh, in online. Um, so um, the, the third question, I think time is almost up, but uh, would you remind me about the third question, which is a little bit... Uh, Oh, it's about um, how local groups try to influence uh, party policy. Are there local groups that are successful at influencing policy? It is related to um, my research, but also Bruce's research, I think. Um, there's always room for that, but it depends on the type of requests you have. So we've studied elite groups, for instance, they are more or less embedded in the system and they are not really questioning the, the right of the party to rule, but they are making uh, sometimes critical suggestions to the party to do certain things in certain ways. And the party are willing. And there is an article by Andy Mirza talking about authoritarian, uh, re, uh, a, fragmented, a fragmented authoritarianism 2.0. And he talks about a number of different policy entrepreneurs that are essentially local groups that are tolerated, uh, but they, they can work through the system uh, to provide policy input in one way or the other. So if you're having questions about environmental you know, uh, pollution, you complain about that environmental organizations are kind of tolerated, uh, human rights, not tolerated, poverty elevation, tolerated. So it's like, it really depends on what type of organization you are and what's the nature of, of this. And I've recently uh, read something about how local governments are really testing out. So they don't know the nature of the local non-government organizations or civil society organizations. They would allow them to operate for a while and then see if they are becoming more challenging, becoming more trouble, then they got discouraged. If they are working with the government, and the government do recognize that uh, there are certain things those non-government organizations will do better than them. So they would actually tolerate, co-opt them or cooperate with them. So there is a little bit room there, even under the current administration right now. So, All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, that was very, very informative. So you just mentioned briefly, and this will be my last question before we'll, we'll turn to the participants' question. Um, you mentioned about Hong Kong and Taiwan. So what has been the party's most recent um, commentary 
about um, Hong Kong and about its uh, approach toward Taiwan and reunification. And I, I leave that to uh, anyone who would like to jump in. Uh, well, why don't I start? Um, I think China's position on Hong Kong has been, or the, the party's position on Hong Kong has been consistent ever since Kissinger had his secret trip to China in early, early 1970s. Uh, it, it is, uh, the official policy is that Taiwan is part of China and the party uh, intends to at some point reunify Taiwan with the mainland. That is a position that's now running up against uh, lots of uh, difficulties in, in its foreign policy as other countries are looking to improve relations with Taiwan, especially the United States, but it's been a, a constant uh, policy for, for the party going back for decades. And it's one that I think most people in China also agree with. Uh, from the point of view of outsiders, it looks like it's, it's being unreasonable. It's, it's not uh, facing up to reality. Um, but Taiwan symbolically is the last remaining piece of traditional Chinese territory that is not under uh, full Beijing sovereignty at this point. And the idea of having a unified China to undo the separation caused by Western powers in the past remains a very popular issue uh, that the party can draw upon. Uh, on Hong Kong, similarly, there's not a lot of, uh, there's a lot of international criticism of, of China's heavy uh, handedness towards Hong Kong, as well eliminating any degree of autonomy that it used to enjoy. But so within China, it's not a policy that, that leads to much criticism. Many people in China thought Hong Kong had lots of rights and freedoms that the rest of people in China did not enjoy. Why were they complaining about uh, their situation when they were already better off? They had been uh, a colony of the UK for about a hundred years. And they weren't fully uh, part of China, too Western in a sense. Um, so even though it's, it's tactics, it's, it's crushing of the dissent movement in, in Hong Kong, uh, and the effort to create a more democratic Hong Kong has been heavily criticized abroad. Uh, it has not attracted much uh, criticism uh, within, within China. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, I think I will now turn to the audience's questions and here's one for Zoe. Um, the questioner asks, is the CCP really operating in a less welcoming international environment? Um, because, for example, the international environment, you can call it the West, quote unquote, but also, but you still have Africa, South and Latin America, who are friendly toward um, their countries, friendly toward China. So uh, if you could address that, please. Uh, yes, this is a great question. And thank you very much for um, giving, asking this question so that, you know, give me a, give, give me more a, a chance to elaborate on what do I mean here. So I'll give you an example in terms of why I think China is operating in a less welcoming international environment. Yes, indeed, we've seen, you know, through the BRI, uh, it looks like China is a, a winning uh, friends all over the world with Chinese money and uh, indeed you know with globalizing Chinese capital with globalizing Chinese companies you see globalizing Chinese influence uh, but, uh, it, but 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 I, I guess you know to what extent to what extent uh, China is really winning uh, people's heart and mind in the sense that China is winning friends is sort of different uh, from to what extent uh, the, 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 the relationship is built upon uh, China's cheap financing and uh, preferential government uh, policies in financing these uh, goodies. So uh, I'll give you an example in terms of, uh, in terms of why uh, China may not necessarily winning a lot of friends, even in developing countries. Take BRIC countries, that, the BRIC, BRICS group as an example. You know, the uh, previously is considered, or for a long time it has been, there, there have been doubts about uh, the uh, survivability of BRICS and uh, to what extent this group could be or informal group could be uh, relevant, but you know, up with twenty years passing, the the this this whole group is still is still there, uh, and uh, it's still you know every year they meet and uh, do summit every year, and uh, the the corporate they have established the new development bank and all that. But look at how China put, uh, put, um, positioned itself in terms of dealing with the developing countries versus 
uh, the China own initiatives. For example, the New Development Bank. New Development Bank is, you know, the, 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 in terms of size, in terms of capacity, is really dwindled in comparison with China's own policy banks. You know, let, whether it is a China Development Bank or China Import and Export Bank. So, in many ways, by working within the, in, by working with developing countries uh, such as BRICS and other emerging market economies, China can reinforce its image in terms of being a developing country rather than a relatively more advanced developing country. So, you know, and, you know, having this hat of a developing country has comes with benefit in terms of international trade policies, in terms of international negotiations, in terms of, you know, um, treat, in terms of dealing with IMF and uh, World Bank. And then on the other hand, do China have, does China have the capacity to go it alone and uh, uh, initiate the China only policies? If you look at you know the BRI, it looks like indeed China has its own capacity. And I'll give you another example in terms of uh, why I consider China's uh, in, uh, international environment is becoming less welcoming. Uh, and this example would come from you know the source of China's growth. And I really wanted to sort of bring this. I, I mean, our audience probably have already uh, known this and be, be very familiar with this. But you know, China benefited from the existing international order that is under the United, under the leadership of the United States. And if you look at the China's uh, current civil, civil, uh, you know, Ch China is becoming uh, self-reliant in terms of uh, a lot of a lot of a lot of uh, high tech industries, including civil. Uh, aviation, but who helped China build its very first civil 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 aviation? The engines is Boeing, is America, and who designed China's or who helped China design China's reform and open up um, roadmap? Goldman Sachs influencers played a significant role here. But if you contrast, you know, China's early days of reform and open up versus China today, the global environment is drastically changed. And the source of China's growth used to, or the source of China's uh, economic development or the source of China's wealth used to come from international trade, especially trade with Western countries. But because of this structural change, especially uh, shrinking demand following the global financial crisis, that really has been a sort of a, a critical juncture, if you will, in how China perceived itself in engaging with the West and engaging with the rest. And the BRI is sort of a rebranding of China's pre-existing condition or pre-existing policy, which is to go out. And if, if previously go out is to go out uh, to the West and go out mostly about the Chinese goods, now going out is probably less so much, still go out to the West, but per, perhaps we are putting more, China is putting more emphasis are going to the rest and uh, to a, y y less about it going out in terms of Chinese goods, but more about the Chinese money. And that's why uh, going back to my earlier comment, why I think financial security is going to be an increasingly more important element in the CCP's calculation. I hope that answers the question. That's a great question. And I hope that, you know, sort of addressed it. Great, thank you so much. And now I have a question for Rongbin. Um, can you please explain the intricate role of the Gongji? Gongji? What is the anti-Gongji discourse like currently and how does this potentially reflect a new wave of Chinese nationalism expressed by China's youth and, um, and how that will affect the CCP? Thank you very much. This is a broad question. I think uh, um, there are a few parts of it. Uh, this is, the term is Gongzhi, which is a abbreviation for Gong Gong Zhi Fenzi, literally means public intellectuals. So public intellectuals was a concept that brought China not very long, actually, um, when pro-liberal media outlets give that title to some of those primarily intellectuals, but also some social activists who advocate, especially political reform in China. So those um, people, the particular group represents a political group in a sense, not really organized, but they represent a direction that China should go. Um, so they were very popular and they rise 
uh, or they rose in a sense with the rise of social media. Their height of influence reached around the year 2010, 11, that was also the height of Weibo. Um, and of course, we know later their influence declined partially because the, of the party's crackdown of Weibo uh, in particular. So um, in terms of Gongzhi, there are two parts of it, the defamation or anti-Gongzhi discourse. Um, there are two parts of it. One, the party doesn't like them. Uh, so there are some of those pro-liberal influential people they're constantly expressing online that uh, are advocating essentially Western style democracy, universal values and things like that. And they are constantly criticizing the Chinese government. So there's a reason why the party doesn't like it. So we, we actually found some evidence of the party trying to defame the group. Um, in the year around 2012, 13, at that time, they hired the 50 Cent Army I mentioned earlier, spread information that's critical towards this group. And what I also find is that um, there's also a popular anti gongju discourse, which is um, not really sponsored by the party initially, um, but they write, or the party actually writes with them. So this is related to what uh, Bruce has mentioned earlier on nationalism. Uh, so also related to the question, the great question. So nationalism is really one important drive of the discourse there that criticizes the public intellectual. But um, I want to note there that the anti boundary discourse is more than just nationalists behind them. Um, those public intellectuals are a online phenomenon, a were uh, an online phenomenon, was an online phenomenon, and they draw criticism not only because of their um, their their kind of value orientation towards liberal democracy, um, but also because of their way of expression. Um, people, a lot of people criticize them for um, kind of rumor spreading, for making up things, for you know, let, let value actually dictate what they want to say. It's like, you know, they, they are using, they are, they are, they are, they are, they are trying to, they're advocate, uh, or they are accused of um, making up sins or distorting facts or all sorts of things like that in order to advance their political agenda. That's what is accused of. Whether that's true or not, that's a different story, but that's one of the, the drive behind the anti gongzhi discourse. But more importantly is really nationalism. Nationalism um, in China works mostly um, hand in hand with regime support, which is kind of the general observation um, by far. Um, so there are multiple reasons. One of the reasons is essentially related to the issues we just talked about what happened in Taiwan, what happened in, in Hong Kong, what happened in Xinjiang. The party can very easily actually use those topics to garner support from the nationalists. And it's very, very persuasive for the nationalists that uh, the party says, look, America or the West is using this as a way to undermine China's revival or China's rise. Of course, I mean, there are a lot of people disagreeing that, but it's very persuasive for Chinese in general, but particularly nationalists. So whenever things happen in Hong Kong or in Xinjiang or in Taiwan, it doesn't really need the party to actually rally for the support now, for instance. Um, also during like the, the pandemic, for instance, you probably have heard about the Wuhan diary written by Fang Fang, a writer. And of course, Fang Fang was critical towards the government. And, but then as since got under control in China, as since deteriorate in the United States, and there was a huge backlash towards Fang Fang. Because look, it's like China is actually performing better than you know, the West and you were criticizing China. You must be you know, uh, having a hidden agenda trying to undermine China, especially considering that Fang Fang's book was published in English translated and published in English very, very swiftly after the Chinese version is, is done. 
it's like there must be something going on behind, right? That's that's the reasoning. So there are a lot of reasoning like that. There are a lot of stories like that. Sometimes very close to conspiracy theory <laughs> series um, in in Chinese social media is the fear, and it's 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 working pretty effectively. Um, that that really kind of first of all um, stimulates nationalist sentiment, and then this defames the regime criticizes, especially the public intellectuals, and also supports the regime. Thank right. you very much for the question thank, again. Thank you. Well, you know, we've talked about the influence of Chinese domestic issues on foreign policy, but conversely, how does US foreign policy influence Chinese domestic politics? So if I could uh, start with you, Bruce, if you'd like to comment on that. Uh, one way that it, it, U.S. policy influences China's domestic politics is by uh, creating a sort of a perceived enemy or threat that it can use to bolster its position. Rongbin was just was just mentioning about how it can use nationalism to kind of rally support for itself, uh, and there's often um, a strong pushback against. Um, U.S. criticism, U.S. government criticism of various Chinese behaviors. Um, Chinese leaders will often say that uh, some criticism by the U.S. or by a Western country has hurt the feelings of the Chinese people, which always seems like an unusual, very emotional way of describing it. Uh, but um, it, it seems to be the case, uh, looking at public opinion data, that it's often perceived as a personal attack on, on people in China, not just a critique of the government. Uh, so US policy is often helpful to the government to be able to um, uh, use that international criticism, foreign criticism to uh, bolster its, its, uh, its own position. Um, when the US was pushing during the Trump administration was pushing on China to change its economic policies, to open its market more, to change its, its uh, rules about importing and exporting, adjust its tariffs. Um, the Chinese leaders could sort of um, show it as being a way of trying to undermine uh, its, its economic policies, uh, slow its growth. Um, it will often argue that uh, the US and other Western countries are trying to contain China, limit its ability to rise. Um, and what it can do instead is uh, show that as a way of, of uh, that the party has to be there to resist those kinds of foreign pressures. Um, it is, it's often also used as a way of sort of reasserting the party's influence. Um, so, uh, so months after Xi Jinping became general secretary back in 2012, uh, in early 2013, the party releases this um, um, internal document that was later leaked. Uh, most things don't leak in China, but this one did. And it became known as Document 9, uh, which uh, identified a variety of, of Western ideas that would not be tolerated to be discussed in classrooms, to be discussed in the media, things like uh, civil society and constitutional government, rule of law, uh, describing them as foreign influences, foreign ideas that were incompatible in China. Uh, so it just stymied any discussion about political reform, about increased social diversity. Um, so it can label those things as hostile foreign influences um, and use that as a way of enhancing the party's own uh, authority and control to limit uh, the, the limited freedoms that society had. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have a question here from Ambassador Kenneth Quinn. He has, remarks that July 22nd is the anniversary of the arrival of the Dixie mission in Yan'an in 1944, when both China and the US were at risk of losing their independence in World War II, um, and they had a historic collaboration. And he's wondering, could this not happen again? Um, is there not a possibility of having some type of collaboration between the United States and China again? I, I open that to whoever would like to try that question. 
uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give a short answer and then let, let uh, my colleagues uh, take it from there. Uh, the circumstances of 1944 and today are so different. Uh, the, the idea that they could collaborate against a common enemy is no longer there. Now the US and China see themselves as each other's main rival. Uh, there are ways that the US and China still can cooperate on the environment, on, on a variety of uh, exporting, importing, on cybersecurity, uh, but there's no kind of perceived common enemy that they are facing. Um, when, President Biden was recently in Europe, uh, whether with the G7 or the EU or NATO, the discussion about how to respond uh, to China's uh, growing influence was not just about its military influence, so that's clearly a part of it, uh, but the response was gonna be, you know, more investment in domestic economies, uh, especially for research and development and science and technology about providing uh, more international support in competition with the Belt and Road Initiative so that other countries would not just have to turn to China for their own investment needs or to be an alternative to it. So there's ways that the competition between the US and China could in fact be beneficial in a variety of ways, uh, but those good intentions about greater investment in domestic economies, greater support uh, for other countries Great ideas, but now they need policies to back them up. Thank you, thank you very much. So in the few minutes that we have remaining, um, I have one last question. And if you're willing to put on your prognostic hats uh, <laughs> for the future here, uh, the CCP has managed to defy the odds um, lasting a hundred years. What does the party need to do to survive another 100 years? And, and how likely is that? So why don't I start with you, Zoe? Uh, yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Uh, I think this is, um, this, this is a very interesting and a very forward, forward looking question. And I would say, you know, for the, for the past 100 years, the CCP was able to uh, legitimize its leadership uh, or has been able to legitimize its leadership based upon uh, the economic growth. And in recent, in, in recent years, this economic growth has, uh, has slowed down, but the newfound pillar of, um, uh, of, of, of uh, political legitimacy has been uh, a, a very big emphasis on, econo uh, on uh, environmental protection. So I think a key issue for uh, political, for the CCP's regime survival, again, is to being able to find uh, new pillars adjusting its uh, perception in terms of new ways or new pillars of how to justify its uh, political leadership. Thank you. And then Rangbin? This is a tough question. And I I mean, I don't do predictions, especially if it is 100 years, right? But in the uh, future, near future. I, I don't think the party is in a kind of a, a life and death crisis. Um, there are, they found new sources of legitimacy, including especially performance legitimacy. Nationalism is working in their favor. Um, plus a little bit uh, regime ad adaptability, they should be able to survive in the near future. But of course, we, we cannot predict what type of crisis would come up. Zoe mentioned the economic crisis um, and also the environmental crisis, which can get out of control. A pandemic like the uh, COVID-19 may get out of control. Yes, the party was able to bring things under control, such crises under control in the past. They were even able to deal with the 1989 Tiananmen Square movement, but we don't know the nature of the crisis in the future. So that makes the prediction ex extremely hard, but it really depends if you just look at the bigger picture in terms of the legitimacy sources, the party have them right now, and the party has demonstrated its ability to, to adapt in the past. And we frankly speaking, don't know how adaptive they are in the future. We see sometimes the adaptability goes down. Sometimes they become more uh, adaptable. So frankly speaking, under President Xi Jinping, the adaptability is actually going down a little bit. Uh, he's doing great on some fronts, 
anti-corruption, for instance, but also there are certain realms where there are a lot of grievances and, uh, and, and uh, dissatisfaction growing there. Um, I don't think that will end President Xi's rule. I mean, some of the panel, um, some of the participants actually ask uh, in the near future, but I do see uh, in the longer term, if that type of uh, um, feature of the party state remains, that might be a potential threat to the survival of the regime. I'll just add a quick footnote to what yes. uh, Rongbin just described. Uh, and that is, in many ways, the main challenge to the party's longevity is the party itself. Um, it is not as adaptable, not as willing to adapt as it used to be. And in many ways, it's moving, trying to move backwards uh, toward a time that was decades ago where the party played a larger role in everyday life. But Chinese society has changed so much uh, in the intervening years. Uh, will Chinese society really allow the party to be as intrusive in its, in its uh, everyday life of having facial recognition software everywhere, uh, about having uh, uh, political education more prominent in schools and more propaganda in the, in the media. Uh, so far, there has not been much pushback. Uh, Rongbin described earlier on some of the online resistance, but it's, it's fairly low key. There hasn't been any strong resistance, uh, but if that irritation towards the party's effort to reinsert itself were to grow, you combine that with a type of economic crisis that, that Zoe mentioned, or another COVID situation, uh, that, that frustration could then uh, blossom uh, when some other, some other incident uh, creates an opening to uh, allow those frustrations to come out. Well, there are so many more questions here, but unfortunately we've run out of time, but I do wanna thank Bruce, Zoe, and Rongbin for a fascinating discussion. It's been really, really very educational um, um, and has really um, shown all of us that there's a lot more <laughs> a lot more to learn about uh, the Chinese Communist Party and, and why it has been the most successful Communist Party in history as far as staying in power. So anyway, with that, I will turn it over to Courtney. All right. Yes. Uh, just uh, thank you so much, Joanna, for leading this discussion. Uh, Rongbin, Zoe, Bruce, thank you. Uh, for really just a fascinating discussion. And thank you everyone for really phenomenal questions. The Q&A box was very lively. And, um, you know, as always, I'm sorry we couldn't get to them all, but um, really enjoyed everyone's insights. Um, just as a note, our next briefing is for members only. It's with uh, Ted Henkin and it's on Cuba after the Castros. So uh, obviously Cuba has been very much in the news. Um, if you're not a member and are interested in becoming a member, um, you can find out more information on our website. There might be a link in the chat box as well. So um, I just wanna say thank you again uh, to our panelists. Thank you, Joanna. Um, and to everyone who joined tonight. Um, and again, our, our plea for help. We are a nonprofit. We'd love to keep this virtual briefing series open um, to everyone around the world. So if you can, please do donate um, every, every dollar count. So thank you so much. Um, and, and again, thank you our panelists for a terrific discussion. And you know, we can reconvene in a hundred years and, and <laughs> see what happens. So, all right, thank you everyone. Bye-bye. Good night. <laughs>